Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Richard Dawkins. Thank you. Okay, is this working here? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes? All right. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Um, I thought it might be a nice thing to do to start off um, talking a little bit about how you became interested in biology and then evolution. And when it occurred to you, as it did to me, that this, this very powerful idea is, is something central to shaping biological diversity. The very powerful idea you refer to didn't really resonate with me until I was an undergraduate. Uh, so I got into biology more or less by accident. And then only when I uh, became an undergraduate, I suppose in my second year, uh, I started to get really, really excited about the Darwinian idea. Um, because, as you said you're, yourself, it is the explanation for us, for all living creatures, for everything, I venture, in the universe which is complex. Uh, because the world of physics is relatively simple. It's very difficult to understand, but it's not complicated. It's not complex. Um, complexity pretty much means biology, or the artifacts of biology. And on this planet, uh, the only way we know for uh, complexity of that sort to arise is evolution by natural selection. Mm -hmm. And I would conjecture it's the only way that it happens in the entire universe, uh, but of course I can't prove that. Mm -hmm. um, it is therefore enormously exciting, enormously important, because it is utterly shattering to the imagination to think of what has happened on this planet. Instead of just being rock and water and sand and ice and the sorts of things which are on rocky planets all over the universe. On this planet, and possibly some others, on this planet we have organized complexity on a stupefying scale. And just, the, just to look at a single cell of a living creature, a single cell of a bacterium, and it blows your mind to think how complicated it is. And we are many, many orders of magnitude more complicated than, than, than that. And the Darwinian process is the process which has given rise to that complexity, including us with our nervous systems, our brains, which are so highly developed that we have finally become capable of understanding the process that gave rise to us. I think for a lot of people, it's very difficult to believe that uh, the complexity comes from random physical forces. And I remember reading in The Blind Watchmaker um, an analogy you had about a primitive person walking along a beach, you know, looking at the organization of the sand and the rocks. You see that the bigger rocks are toward the water and the finer sands and pebbles are further up. And you know, sometimes there's a line of garbage where I grew up. But um, <clears throat> so you might be tempted to think that, you know, that. Uh, that the creator is uh, organized and tidy and likes to have things in this way. But we know now that the, the creation of those patterns of organization from disorders created by wave action you describe in the book. Um, so how is it that, um, that this process, um, you know, in that way, I think it's very easy for people to understand. What's the central thing that people need to understand to, to understand how human beings and the complexity that that we sort of entail came to be? Well, I think we have to be very careful when we use a word like random, because you just used the word random uh, by which you meant undirected, by which you meant not steered by any kind of conscious deliberate design. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, if it were random in the sense of uh, taking a whole lot of bits and shaking them up at random and seeing if they fell into, into place, uh, it very much is not random in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, the, the waves producing ripples on, of sand or garbage on the, on the shore might be in a sense random in that sense, but um, natural selection is a non-random process in the sense that it is cumulative over many generations of the waves shuffling the sand grains process. Mm 
the waves shuffling the sand grains you could think of as a kind of one generation mm. random okay. process. But yeah. natural selection uh, cascades those processes into many succeeding generations where each one is selected so that it's a little bit better than the one before, where better is defined simply as better at surviving. And once you've got that, and it can only come about through the existence of something equivalent to a genetics, a self-replicating, a self-copying process, once you've got that, then cumulative, non-random survival over many cumulative generations can give rise to the prodigious complexity that so impresses us. Another example that you use, um, the idea that randomness is involved in this process that creates diversity and complexity seems counterintuitive. And the wonderful example that you use is uh, basically a sort of thorn in the eye of people who say, well, you know, randomness, you could write all the complete works of Shakespeare. You have enough monkeys bashing away at a typewriter randomly. Um, but as you pointed out, the selection doesn't work that way. It actually preserves the beneficial mutations when they do come up. And so there's the example where you, you have um, me th the phrase from uh, Shakespeare, me thinks it like a weasel. And uh, if you wait and randomly bash to try to get that sentence, it's very improbable statistically. But if you preserve, and I think the example from your book was your son randomly bashing away, as soon as he hit a letter that was correct, we preserve it and go on. It only took about 40 generations, right? That's right. I mean, that's, that's the, the key point, that, that, that the monkeys bashing away at, at a typewriter would take almost forever to produce even a single phrase of Shakespeare. Uh, but if you have a sort of ratcheting process such that each generation breeds the following generation, and of the offspring produced, the ones that are most perfect, in this case, most resemble the target phrase, mm -hmm. are the ones that you breed from in the next generation, then it only takes about 40 generations to produce the phrase that I chose, which was Shakespeare's, methinks it is like a weasel. Um, that's just a, a, a very short phrase. Now that, of course, is a highly artificial example because it is aiming at a particular target, right. which natural selection doesn't do. Uh, or if it does aim at a target, uh, the target is an extremely general one, which is simply survival. So there's no sense in which there's a kind of distant target on the horizon, like a phrase of Shakespeare. There was never the human frame, the human body, as a distant target of evolution. A lot of people think that that, that somehow was the case. Absolutely not. Um, there are millions of, of independent results of natural selection. None of them could ever be called a target. Um, the only criterion is survival strictly gene survival. So this idea of genes as being the unit of selection is something that you've championed throughout your career. Um, what uh, implications do you think that has for um, the study of evolutionary diversity? Well, it, it's really a, a, a way of defining how the process has to be. This process of non-random survival, non-random ratcheting, depends upon there being something that is capable of surviving. Mm -hmm. And genes are the only things in the biological sphere which are capable of surviving in the sense required, which is that the, uh, they make accurate copies of themselves, very, very accurate copies of themselves, but not quite perfectly accurate. There are occasional mistakes. And so, as you know, it's these occasional mistakes, these random mutations, which give rise to the diversity, which can lead to, uh, to um, improvement. But nothing else in the hierarchy of biological organization has this property of being potentially immortal. Genes do, genetic information, not the genes themselves. I mean, they're, the physical matter of DNA decays very rapidly, but the information contained in the sequence of bases in DNA is potentially immortal. It can go on for hundreds of millions of years. Mostly it doesn't, but potentially it can. And therefore there is a very real difference between those stretches of DNA which do go on for a very long time and those which don't. And that is natural selection. And nothing else in the hierarchy of life has that property of potentially going on forever, which therefore makes the difference 
between those that do go on forever and those that fail because they don't cut the mustard. So one of the, uh, one of the wonderful analogies that we have for uh, replicating systems like that um, that uh, is brought up in many of your works are, for example, replicating clay, clay crystals. There are things that um, have a property of replication where their abundance um, is dictated by their fidelity of copying and the rate at which they do that. And that's just simply what happens, right? And the way that a certain type of clay crystal can predominate and sort of end up taking over a bank, if you will, of a river is very similar process in this way, with the exception that the replication machinery there is not very yes. sophisticated. Um, I mean, cr crystals are, are a very n nice case because, because crystals grow uh, by um, atoms um, g getting out of solution and joining up in just the correct places in the crystal that's already there. And so whatever structure is already there gets, gets, uh, gets replicated. Um, however, in order to be an interesting replicator, by interesting I mean biologically interesting, Darwinianly interesting, there has to be a, um, a, a possibility for variation. Um, it's, it's not enough to say um, the atmosphere is full of oxygen atoms and so you might as well talk about the selfish oxygen atom as the selfish gene. Mm. Um, there has to be a sense in which a pattern or something is replicated with variation with the possibility of error, the equivalent of mutation, um, such that some va variants, some products of error, some variants uh, are more likely to survive than others, and that, of course, DNA has par excellence. Um, the clay crystals you're talking about, according to the Scottish chemist Graham Cairn Smith, have a kind of rudimentary version of that, mm -hmm. because a crystal that, uh, for some reason, develops a glitch, there's a mistake in the, in, the, in the way in which the atoms fall onto the existing crystal, and if that mistake is then repeated forever after, or until there's another mistake, um, that does have kind of a rudimentary version of the, of the property. Uh -huh. But it doesn't become biologically interesting until there's a population of alternative varieties mm. such that there can be non-random su success, non-random survival mm. of some variants rather than other variants. Cairn Smith actually went so far as to suggest that clay crystals, inorganic clay crystals, could have been the forerunner of uh, life. Because he, uh, in writing books about the origin of life, correctly recognized that the key stage in the origin of life would have to have been, we don't know what it was, but it would have to have been the origin of the first self-replicating, self-copying entity in the sense in which I've, I've just said. DNA cannot have been that original replicator because DNA is what Ken Smith called a high-tech replicator. It needs too much infrastructure to, to copy itself. So he, tr he tried to think of what might have gone before the eventual takeover, as he put it, by DNA. So he saw DNA as a, a sort of late usurper of the role of self-replicator, of genetic molecule. And he saw as the predecessor of DNA, uh, he saw inorganic uh, clay crystals. And he makes a kind of reasonably plausible case, but it's not, it's not a case that's widely accepted by other researchers on the origin of life. Well, this is fascinating because it seems then that there are intermediate molecules that are maybe on the way to becoming full-blown life like uh, replica replicators in the sense of they create life. Y yeah, yes, I mean, it, nowadays it's more fashionable to talk about RNA yeah. as being the possible intermediate in, in that sense. And I think it's a very interesting idea because if you ask the question, why, in what sense is DNA too much of a high-tech replicator, um, one crucial point is that DNA requires protein enzymes in order to replicate itself. And the enzymes that are needed to help DNA to replicate itself have to be made under the tutelage of DNA itself. So as a catch-22, you can't have, have one without, without the other. Um, enzymes, 
are mostly proteins in, in, the, in the world in which, in which we know. And enzymes have their catalytic properties uh, because of their physical shape. And the physical shape of a protein molecule, a globular protein, is determined by the, um, the, the one-dimensional order of amino acids, which cause it to coil up into a tight knot shape. And the, the shape of the coil, the shape of the, of the knot in which it falls, is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, which in turn is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of DNA bases. Um, now, it's the three-dimensional shape of the protein molecule that gives it its catalytic, its en enzymic uh, properties. RNA has some of the qualities of, of an enzyme. It can do the same job as protein to coil up into shapes which, which have a catalytic function. And RNA also has, not so good as DNA, but it has some of the properties of DNA as a replicator. So modern life on this planet is a partnership between DNA, which is a brilliant replicator, but a hopeless enzyme, and protein, which is a brilliant enzyme, but a hopeless replicator. And they therefore need to be in partnership together. But RNA is a moderately good replicator and a moderately good enzyme. And therefore the thought is that before the partnership between DNA and protein got going, RNA could have stood on the stage alone doing both jobs. And then you got a kind of bifurcation of the function of the functions later. So the original thinking of Cairn Smith is still there, but instead of having inorganic crystals as the forerunner, uh, we have RNA as the suggested forerunner. And that's a, a, cu a currently very fashionable idea. The uh, self-catalytic activity of RNA is fascinating. And that makes it, you know, this idea of the RNA world that was a pre-DNA biology. Um, one of the things we spoke about earlier at eating was education and talking about evolution and having people appreciate that from an early age because it does sort of form the scaffolding upon which you can hang a lot of facts in biology. When I learned biology, I learned evolution sort of last. I mean, I, 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 first of all, I learned about cells and, and cellular chemistry and things like that. How on earth can you appreciate cells and cellular chemistry without knowing what, what it's all for? I mean, how can you learn, how can you even begin to learn biology without starting off by, by an idea of what it's all for, where it all comes from, what the history of it is? And so I would turn the sort of textbook order in which biology is taught, where very often evolution is left to the last chapter, make it the first chapter and teach it young, because it's not actually that, that difficult to understand. <laughs> So over the years, I've had an ability to, uh, an, an opportunity to appreciate the ideas in your books and to understand that that not teaching evolution early has pretty big consequences. So uh, one of the things I remember reading as a graduate student was they had finished the, uh, the crystal structure of um, the protein that does a translation of genes into proteins. And uh, it is made up of many, many uh, globular proteins and it's a very complicated structure. It also has catalytic RNAs that are are part of it, and, and the big question was, you know, is it the catalytic RNAs that do the translation that turn the, the DNA into protein, or is it the RNA, the proteins are RNA, the scat, you know? And uh, in the paper where they describe the crystal structure, and they, they say, they say the catalytic RNA is the actual thing that, that connects together the amino acids during translation. And this is in support of the RNA world theory. Mm -hmm. It was not mentioned at all in the paper. Interesting, yeah. And, you know, and that's the kind of thing is where we become yeah. so specialized. Yes in these different areas, yes. but evolution seems to be one thing that can tie it together. Yeah, so they just don't make that, that connection. Right. right. Yeah. Um, well, how early should we start teaching people about evolution? About six or seven, I should think. <laughs> Is that a good age? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you could certainly teach uh, about evolutionary history at a, at a very, very young age because you can you can ask a child, you say, well, you know who, who uh, your parents' parents were, they're your grandparents, and um, they must have had grandparents, and you can kind of go back, 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 back. 
and ask the child to imagine what their 10,000 great-grandfather looked like, uh, and then their million great-grandfather looked like, and you can gradually show the child a picture of what your million great-grandfather looked like, um, <laughs> or, or your, your 200 million great-grandfather, who would have been some sort of a fish. Um, <laughs> and um, th that's, that's easy enough to get across. Um, the, <laughs> But, but, but then you need, you need to, to, to point out that it's actually not... Um, there's something a little bit counterintuitive here, because there was never a sudden change from a, a fish into something that wasn't a fish. If you were to... You could easily ask a child to imagine um, getting your, your, your father, his father, his or mother, his, her mother, her mother, going back, 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 line them up in a great big line, stretching for thousands of miles, and you walk along this line, going back, back, back to the fish, to the 200 million great-grandparent, at no point ever in that line would you come across an individual who belonged to a different species from its parents or its children. So at every single stage, the successive members of the chain would be all but identical to the one before, the one after, as identical as parents and children ever are. And yet, because there's such an enormous number of generations, imperceptibly, by gradual degrees, as you walk backwards in time, you would make the, the whole gamut of change from human to fish, while, then, while there would never be a perceptible change in any one generation at all. And, People might find that counterintuitive until you point out to them. Children might find it counterintuitive until, until you point out. You were once a baby, then you became a toddler, and then you became a, what you are now. But there never was a moment when you woke up and suddenly ceased to be a baby and became a toddler. There never will be a moment when you cease to be a child and become a teenager. There never will be a moment when you cease to be a teenager and become an adult. There'll be your 18th birthday when you're recognized by law as an adult. But that, of course, means nothing. You don't suddenly wake up and say, oh, I'm an adult, finally. <laughs> um, and, and, and yet, we change through, through life. The, the change is, is too slow to be perceptible, just as the movement of the hour hand of a watch is too slow to be perceptible. But if you come back and look at it every now and again, um, you see that it's moved. But that should, any of that should be, should be easy to get across to a six-year-old. And we have wonderful analogies for this idea of, of uh, continuity and deep time that, that, uh, that we can reference. Um, like the development of a human being, you spoke then that you know, there's a continuity, but there's change there. Um, the concept of how much time has elapsed, though, to, for these things to happen. Why is it so hard for people to appreciate that? Well, it's, it's so off the scale with respect to any time that we're used to dealing with. I mean, we're... we're our, our lifespans are measured in decades, and we are asked to, I mean, ev even studying history, we can cope with centuries all right, but by the time we get back to the ancient Egyptians, or the Sumerians, or the Babylonians, we kind of get a tingling up the spine. This is sort of lost in the mists of deep, distant time. It's nothing compared to evolutionary time. And we've got to start learning to deal with not just millions of years, but hundreds of millions of years. And the human mind is not evolved to cope with time on that sort of scale. We can do it by analogy, and uh, as you've said, I mean, the analogy of the developmental time of a, of a human, you can analogize it to a clock. Um, that's one way of doing it, and you know that if you say that the, since the origin of life, uh, if it's one 24-hour clock, what does it tell you? Somebody probably knows the answer. Humanity came on the scene five, uh, what, five, 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 five minutes minute. before midnight or something of that, that sort. Um, a a favourite one of mine, which is not my own, one that I've adopted, is, is you hold out your arm and, and you reckon the origin of life is, is where your microphone is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and, and the present is, uh, is out at the tip of your fingers. Um, and it's, it, it's all bacteria out to about there, uh, and the dinosaurs are about there. 
um, and um, human fossils, but people like Lucy come at, at about the, where you're the tip of your, near the tip of your fingernail. And the whole of human history, recorded human history, the, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Hebrews, the Romans, the Greeks, uh, the Middle Ages, the whole of recorded human history falls as the dust from one stroke of the nail file. That is a beautiful analogy, thank you. <laughs> um, this idea of, uh, I think this is what makes evolution so difficult for so many people. Is That's that, one of the that, things, the, you know, the time span is one of the The time span, another a wonderful analogy that you use. So everyone knows a, a chihuahua and a Great Dane, right? You know, that these are animals that are derived from a wolf. And one of the great analogies that we use in the introduction evolution course that I teach here is from one of your books, I think it's Blind Watchmaker. We say, if you go from a wolf to a chihuahua, and that's one human step, that's about 2,000 years of human artificial selection, not natural selection, but just to get an idea, that's kind of a radical change, right? Like this wolf to a little thing, great thing. And if that's 2,000 years, you ask us to imagine, what would it be to walk through the, the history of life? How many steps would you have to take? And anyone have any ideas? Or people in the class can't answer. But you would have to walk from London to Cairo, right? And this is just something that I can't imagine doing that. I think the, po the point there is, is that the, the, the difference between a wolf and a chihuahua is a pretty substantial difference. And if, if that can be achieved in, what, what did you say, a couple of paces? One step. One, one step. step. If that can be achieved in, in one step, wolf to chihuahua, how much could be achieved on the, the long slog from London to Cairo? Um, of course, as you said, the, the, the wolf to chihuahua is artificial selection, not natural selection. But there's really no difference. I mean, it's just differential survival of genetic types. Uh, so whether it's artificial selection or natural selection, artificial selection shows the power of the principle of selection, how you can, how, what can be achieved by selection. Going from wolf to chihuahua in, in one step, where the whole of evolution is the, is the, is the march, from, from England to, to, to Cairo. So if we can place ourselves in that situation by way of these analogies, um, why do you think it continues to be so difficult for people to um, appreciate that we have a, you know, I, I, um, I struggle myself in my own life. I, may, I teach this to students, I, um, and I have uh, spoken about it with my family, for example. But my mother says, you know, a human heart is made of the same material as a chimpanzee heart, I don't see the difference. You know, I don't see what's going on. You know, I don't see what the big deal is. You know, somehow we're made of the same compounds or materials. But what I took away from, uh, what I, I just was left with this, essentially, that the reason that the heart in me has the same shape, the morphology, and it works the same as in my mother's, because I inherited it from her. And the reason a chimpanzee heart beats the same as a human heart, in, similarly, not the same, right, is because we inherited it from actually the same grandmother. Just as you said in this mm. beautiful march of life, that that individual existed at one time as a common ancestor. Um, in this uh, great chain of unbroken continuation from a fish to a person, what does a genome look like? How, how much does it change from generation to generation? Is it a very radical change or is well, it also uh, gradual? Um, the in, in, the, in the short term, it, it's not a radical change. It's, it's just changes in the, the actual bases uh, in, in, in particular, particular genes. Um, there are, of course, uh, larger changes because um, numbers of chromosomes change, the size of the genome is different in different li lineages, and therefore, at some point, um, the genome does get larger or smaller. Um, it gets larger by gene duplication. Whole chunks of genome can get split off and parked somewhere else in the genome, and that's how the genome can get larger. And when that happens, the different chunks that once upon a time were replicas of each other can then start evolving in different directions, doing different jobs. So for example, there are a number of different hemoglobin molecules uh, which clearly have the same ancestry. They're all descended from a common molecular ancestor. They split apart into different parts of the genome and went their separate ways in different parts of the genome 
doing different jobs. Uh, and that, that's a model for what happens over and over again, and that, that's how the genome becomes, becomes bigger and more, and more complicated. But going back to the hearts, I, I think I ought to qualify what I said when I said that as you go back, back, back in time, there's never a moment when there's a radical step. You do have to remember that, that I mean, we have a four-chambered heart, and um, fish have a two-chambered heart. So um, at some point, there must have been, I mean, you, 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 it's, it's not easy to imagine a two-and-a-quarter-chambered heart. And so um, there must be a, a certain number of major steps of that type. Um, another example would be um, snakes have an enormous number of vertebrae, uh, but different species of snakes, and all snakes have ma many more vertebrae than we do, but different species of snakes um, have different numbers of vertebrae. And you can't imagine a snake that has um, that goes from 100 vertebrae to 101 vertebrae by going through an, a stage of, uh, of, uh, of a hundred and a half vertebrae. Um, so there must have been a mutant that had a, 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 at least a whole number increase in the number of vertebrae at some stage in, in evolution, maybe even more. That's not actually as difficult to imagine as you might think because although each vertebra is complicated, it's got the, the, the um, vertebral bird itself has got ribs, it's got muscles that go with um, segmental muscles, nerves, uh, blood vessels, all built on this, on this segmented repeat pattern. But because the pattern is there, and because the genome already has the capacity to build a segment, building a second segment is a very easy thing to do. And so, and, and nowadays, the embryology of that is very well understood, so-called um, Hox genes. Um, there are fish that have four eyes instead of the usual two eyes. They have the usual two eyes looking out that way, the way a normal fish does, and they have a couple more eyes looking downwards. And we can conjecture that this fish suffers from predation, predators coming from, from below, and so it, it, maybe benefits by having this extra pair of eyes looking, looking downwards. But the evolution of the extra pair of eyes, I don't think it would be reasonable to suggest that it went through a stage of having um, 2.1 eyes, 2.2 eyes, 2.3 eyes, etc. It probably happened in a single step. And again, that's not difficult to imagine because the embryological and genetic machinery for making an eye is already there. And so probably all that had to happen was the duplication of a Hox gene that said build two eyes instead of one using all the same machinery uh, as you used to build, it, to, to build it before. So that, that, I wanted to put it, that in as a kind of qualification yeah. of that um, ultra-gradualistic point. Um, this idea that there are du gene duplications, for example, at the level of the genome, which is in, um, in a way this is the blueprint of how to make a human being or how to make a cabbage or an octopus, right? Um, Rudy Raff has a wonderful analogy. He says, you know, this, if this manuscript is the thing that we need to modify to improve, you know, it's kind of like trying to improve, evolution is like trying to improve an engine while it's still running. You know, it has to perform because yes. you want to tinker. So the question is, how can you do that? It seems very difficult. Yeah. And one way to do that is to duplicate a gene. So uh, as you know, we have hemoglobin binds oxygen. There's alpha globin, beta globin. They have origin as genes that duplicated and uh, diverged in function and now they work together to carry oxygen. That's exactly the kind of thing that you see happening all over the place. Now that we've been able to sequence genomes, we see m massive evidence for gene duplication and this allows one to tinker, essentially, while still having the engine running. It's not quite as bad as still having the engine running, of course, because um, evolution is not a change of one adult body into another adult body. It goes back to a single single-celled egg first and so the, the new embryo develops um, and the, the engine in a sense stops uh, in each generation but but that's a quibble I mean the, the, the analogy is a, is a very good one so then if this process of the replicators and of the information being can uh, accumulate in via vi natural selection in this cumulative selection fashion um, 
what does that say about the probability or the possibility of life on other planets? Would it have a similar uh, character? Would it have to be a replicator, you think, as well, well the, to be I, life? Y yes. I, um, we, we've, we've only got a single sample of life to look at, uh, the, the one that we have on this planet. And every, every living thing that's ever been looked at on this planet is astonishingly the same. At the, at the machine code level, we, we all run the same machine code. It's not as though some creatures are IBM PCs and some are Macs. I mean, they're all, they're all the same. Um, but, but it's all kind of frills on the, on the surface that makes the difference between, between them. Um, if we start moving into other planets, to exobiology, then we have no idea. We can only guess. We can make informed guesses as to how similar it would have to be. Would it, I mean, you, you asked, would, would there have to be uh, something equivalent to replicate, something equivalent to genes? My very strong guess, I put my shirt on the answer being yes. That what, whatever else you can say about life elsewhere in the universe, if there is life elsewhere in the universe, and I bet there is, uh, it's got to have a genetics. I suspect it's got to be digital genetics, not analog genetics. Uh, DNA is digital. It's not binary, it's quaternary, but it is digital. Um, and that gives it the extreme high fidelity which seems to be required in order for natural selection to work. So let's put our shirt on digital genetics. Does it have to be DNA? Well, I doubt it. Um, I, I don't know, know enough chemistry to be able to say, but my, my guess is there probably are other kinds of molecules that could do the job. Although I don't know that for certain, and I would throw it out as a challenge to chemists here to try to imagine an alternative to DNA, an alternative chemical system which could do the job of providing a replicator plus a great variety of coded information. Um, would there have to be something like protein, or at least enzymes? I think there probably would. I mean, I think there's got to be um, something uh, capable of um, no, I mean, maybe that's being too that's being um, too unimaginative. Maybe maybe a chemist could produce imaginative schemes that didn't involve protein. Um, you can go on asking these questions. Would there would there have to be multicellularity? I mean, large creatures on our planet are all made of lots and lots of cells, and all the cells have the same basic plan. Um, we don't know of a way of becoming large other than making lots and lots of cells, but does that have to, is that inevitable? Is that something that has to be true of all life, or is that something that just happens to be true of life on this planet? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, does there have to be something equivalent to sex? Well, no, because not every creature on this planet has sex. Um, you can go on asking these questions where, in every case, what you're asking is, how much of what we know about our kind of life had to be so, because there's no other way of doing it, and how much just happens to be so on this planet? Does it have to be so that you get a life cycle in which in every generation, it returns to something like a single cell, something very small and simple. Or could you imagine a life form which evolved by just changing, uh, rather like getting a bit of clay and kneading it, molding it into, into shape? My guess is it has to be something like what we have, which is a return to uh, a single cell origin. Um, in every generation. And again, maybe I'm being too unimaginative. It, the day when we first discover another life form on another planet will be, if I'm still alive, it would be the most exciting day of my life. It would be the most astonishing thing to live through. Uh, and um, I, I fear it's very unlikely. I, I believe there is life on other planets, but the, the reason for that belief is the, is the extraordinarily large number of planets that there are available. But the trouble is that the other side of that is that the, the universe being so huge, um, 
the islands of life dotted around through the universe may be so spread out, so sparse, that although they all have life, um, these, these islands, they may be so, so widely separated from each other that, that they never meet, never, n not only never, never meet face to face, but never even meet by um, any kind of detectability. So on this planet, um, you know, we have this question of historical contingency about whether we would ever be able to communicate with any intelligent life. But there's no sense that, uh, that uh, the organisms evolving on another planet would evolve to recognize, for example, their own evolution. No, that's right. right? I mean, it, um, I, I think it's, it's vanishingly unlikely that, that we would ever be visited by um, creatures from outer space. I mean, if they exist, there's, there's such enormous reaches of space, why would they bother to come here? Um, but um, if, they, if they had radio mm -hmm. technology, um, then e e that, that's a, a, a better possibility because that can be broadcast outwards in all directions. An ever-increasing uh, sphere of bathing in, um, in um, rad radioactivity um, so not, not, I'm sorry, um, ra radio um, si signals. But you raised the question of, 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 of how we would know or, or how, the, how they would know. Um, I, I think, um, well, the, 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 ra the, the radio signals that would be picked up would be non-random, probably in an interesting way. And they could even be tailored to be deliberately um, labeled as the product of, of intelligent life. I mean, the sort of science fiction speculation, I mean, I think Carl Sagan advocated broadcasting prime numbers. So if you, if you send out a signal that goes one, two, three, four, five, seven, etc., going up through the, through the prime numbers, um, it's all but impossible to think of a non-biological uh, source of prime numbers. And so if a life form wanted to advertise its own existence, then a simple way of doing it would be to broadcast a cycle of prime numbers, and that would pretty instantly label it as, uh, as living. Um, so the very non-randomness that is sort of in evidence for life, it would be the very thing we use to communicate. Yes, I guess in that, a way. that's that's yeah. right, and there's something rather special about prime numbers because other sorts of non-randomness cannot generate. Yes, um, I mean, it, prime numbers probably actually demonstrate intelligent life as well as just life. Um, not quite. You can just about imagine a non-intelligent origin of prime numbers. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the main one that's been suggested is uh, cicadas. Um, you know that cicadas have plague years, and in America, I think there are two separate cycles. There's, is there a 17-year cicada and a 13-year, or is it a 19-year? 13 and 17. Well, those are prime numbers, and um, there has been a suggestion that natural selection has shaped cicada life cycles to plague in prime numbers of years to make it impossible or very difficult for predators to evolve their life cycles to be in synchrony with the, um, with the cicada life cycles. So if the, if the cicadas, say, uh, had their plague years in every four, every four years, then it would not be that difficult for natural selection to favor a predator that also had a four-year uh, a four-year cycle, um, or if it was eight years, every other um, four-year cycle, that was something of that sort. But 13 years would be a very difficult um, number to come up with, and, and 17 even more, even more difficult. Um, so there has been a suggestion that cicadas have, uh, al have arrived at their cycle times of 13 years and 17 years as, a, as an adaptation, but at the end of an evolutionary arms race against similarly cycling predators. So that's, that's one way, a very far-fetched way, in which prime numbers can be generated, at least in principle, by a non-intelligent source. It's still a life uh, source, though.
So it seems that this idea of the replicators is so profoundly important to science and to understanding our place in the universe that people have put it up there, this idea of evolution, with a challenge to our very understanding of who we are with, in comparison, for example, the heliocentric view of the solar system with the sun that, you know, versus the uh, geocentric view that we're at the center. And I think I would argue that it's even more unsettling and more sort of, uh, it really zooms us out from our place in the universe. Yes. Where we see um, that, right? I mean, I, I, think, I think they've both been very salutary lessons to humanity and, and the um, um, dethroning the Earth as the center of the universe must have been quite a shock. Uh, but um, showing where we come from, showing that it's possible uh, let alone plausible and indeed true that living things like us come from uh, purely physical forces. And also, I mean, th th another thing that's unsettling is, is, is showing that we are cousins of monkeys. Um, the Victorians didn't like that idea. And I think some modern people, you, know, you, you hear, hear people saying, well, I'm not descended from no monkey, you may be, but... but um, <laughs> So that's one of the challenges. We have a, um, to wrap up now, unfortunately. Yes. Um, we have to uh, give the room back. Um, what I would uh, like to just ask you real um, briefly here at the end, say um, a lot of people here are interested not just in the extension or understanding of evolution and understand our physical place in the world, by a full appreciation of the complexity of these ideas. But they're interested in um, your later work, where you take things a step further to say, not only is this the organic reason for our existence, but this is a reason, for example, for perhaps not to believe in other uh, points of view, such as uh, you know, some religious ideas, because their provenance and, and their explanatory ability uh, is in conflict in some ways with this story that we have from science. It's grossly wasteful, isn't it? I mean, the, the, when you've got a beautiful idea, a beautiful story that tells you how we get to be the way we are, the complex way we are, from simple beginnings by utterly explicable, sensible, step-by-step -step process, um, to suddenly say, oh, but I want to believe that there's a, a supernatural being on top of all that. What a wasteful idea. What a profligate, superfluous... Um, <laughs> So there's this idea about false fixed beliefs that you talk about in the God delusion. And something that I think a lot of people have access to information now. We try to understand, decide for ourselves what's true and what's real and who's an authority. Um, so to what extent do you think that the Darwinian point of view or the scientific method is, is a useful tool to find truth? I mean, it's, do you think that that is, um, that, that, that sci we apply science to fly planes and to make Teflon. And it seems to me that you're arguing we should apply that same rigorous point of view to other aspects of human uh, thinking, basically. Yes. Um, I, I think it's... I, I, I would agree with Daniel Dennett that it's arguably the, the best idea anybody ever had. Um, I mean, he... That's, of course that's arguable. I mean, Einstein, Newton, um, Galileo. Um, but... Well, I think one thing you can say about the Darwinian idea is that it is, has an astonishingly high ratio of what it explains divided by what it needs to postulate in order to do the explaining. Um, it's a very, very powerful idea in that sense, that you, you only need to postulate um, really high fidelity replication. That's all, that's all you need to get, to get it going. And once you've got that, you can explain the whole of life, all the complexity of, of life. Um, so it's a very, very powerful idea, but an exceedingly simple idea, need and an exceedingly simple idea. It's its very simplicity at the bottom of the ratio, which divides into the complexity of what it explains. And that simplicity not only makes it a powerful idea, it also makes it in principle, very easy to understand. And so educationally, it's a very, very powerful, a very valuable educational tool because it, 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 can, it can convey what a 
what a powerful idea really, really is. Um, the theory of general relativity is another very powerful idea, but it's very hard to understand, and so it may be a, a less um, of, a, of a vital educational tool that we can use on a, on a wide on a wide public. I mean, the, the, the downside of that is that be, because relativity is so hard to understand, uh, it, it doesn't arouse the same skepticism as as um, evolution by natural selection, because as Jacques Monod, the great French biochemist said, the trouble with natural selection is that everybody thinks he understands it. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's a wonderful place to stop. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap things up. So uh, I think at this point, we'd like to open it up uh, to questions from the audience mm -hmm. for yeah, a little so while. So I guess just everyone can line up at the two microphones there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the origin of uh, what we think of as, in general, morality? Is it a uh, evolutionary construct um, simply because we need order um, to form communities at a human level? Um, or do we have certain truths that we can get at? Um, and how do we get around what David Hume described as kind of this is-ought uh, dichotomy problem? Well, the, the is-ought problem um, is the one where he says you can't say um, that what is is right. You can't say that, that just because something is the case, that makes it morally right. Um, I suppose um, uh, that, yeah, I, I won't say anything more about that. But um, the question of where morality comes from, I think you can make a very good case that morality has its origins in the natural selection of brains uh, in a world where um, we lived in small tribal groups, uh, where uh, the, tribal, the small tribal groups were uh, closely related kin, kin groups, um, which, as those of you who know something about natural selection will know, that tends to favor altruism, sympathy, cooperation, and also where the members of the small tribal group knew each other individually and were likely to meet each other again and again throughout their life. That also, there's good Darwinian theory to explain why that fosters cooperation and altruism. And so under those conditions, our brains would have been shaped to have a kind of lust to be good in the same way as our brains were shaped to have a lust for sex, uh, because that's, that, that's more obvious. Um, <laughs> But, but just as the lust for sex remains, even when its reproductive function is cut off from it, as when we use contraception, we still have the lust. Um, similarly, we now live in a completely different world where we no longer live in small tribal groups. And therefore, we are no longer surrounded by kin. We're no longer surrounded by um, uh, potential reciprocators uh, the, who we know throughout our lives. Just as we haven't lost our sexual lust, so we also haven't lost our lust to be good. So that would be a perfectly respectable, and you can elaborate on that, and others have done so, um, a perfectly respectable Darwinian basis for immorality. But then a lot more comes in after that in, in, in history, cultural evolution, the development of laws and customs, uh, and um, moral philosophy, indeed. Uh, so. I think that the, 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 that the moral sense is a very complicated amalgam of evolutionary history and, and cultural history. Uh, one thing that strikes me very forcibly about it is that it does in detail change from decade to decade. Um, there's something I call the shifting moral zeitgeist. Um, the things that we consider right and wrong now are rather different from even what people considered right and wrong a hundred years ago. And uh, if you go back to the Middle Ages, um, it, it becomes even more, more different. And that seems to be an advancing change which happens regardless of whether we're religious or not. Uh, it's something that I mean, everybody who lives in the early 21st century has a, s a broadly similar feeling of what's right and wrong. We all agree that slavery is wrong, we all agree that sexual discrimination uh, is wrong and so on. Whereas 100 years ago, they didn't believe that sexual discrimination was wrong, and 200 years ago, they didn't believe that slavery was wrong. <laughs>
And this sort of change is, is happening all the time. And it happens in parallel on a broad front. Uh, and it doesn't seem to owe anything to, to religion, which is quite interesting. Thank you. And I want to uh, thank you for, for being here tonight. And uh, this, this question, I, I am steering clear of uh, religion on this one, but I am going to ask this with uh, wagering that many of us here are part of the non-religious, uh, humanist, atheist, agnostic community. One of the unfortunate side effects of uh, last, our last election cycle here in this country was many governorships and state legislatures uh, being now controlled uh, with, with vast majorities by one party or being completely dominated in state legislatures and, and governorships by one party. I won't, I won't name names, but uh, uh, the downside and, uh, of this and something that many of us expected to be coming was the attempt to continue to jam creationism or intelligent design uh, into science, public uh, classrooms in their science classrooms. So I, wa I wanted to ask you uh, if you could just talk about the importance of people, especially young people, getting involved politically, uh, because I do think that uh, people like you and me are, are a untapped voting block in this country, and so please uh, let us know how important it is for this to happen. I totally agree with you and have nothing to add. <laughs> All right. That is a per <laughs> Hello there. Hi, thanks for speaking for us. Really appreciate you coming. Um, I, was, I was curious, uh, I know a lot about your, very, your physical sort of theories on life, but I was wondering, um, do you have a cosmological worldview? So how everything began or what it's all for? Or is that even a question that you think is worth pondering? Well, how it all began is a question for a cosmologist or a physicist, which I'm not, and I've, I've read the books, and no doubt you have as well, and, and I, I don't have anything uh, to add to that. Um, what, what is it all for? Well, it's not for anything. It, it just happened. Um, and uh, it's, ve it's a very fascinating story, uh, how, how it just happened. It's a story that physicists are uncovering, and uh, in, in the case of our universe, have got back to a tiny fraction of a second since the origin of the of our present universe um, and they're still working on the time before that and indeed the origin of time itself the origin of the universe itself and that's something which physicists are now working on I'd like to recommend a forthcoming book by Lawrence Krauss um, on uh, how you get something from nothing and Lawrence Krauss, the distinguished physicist, makes the case that the universe originated from literally nothing uh, by processes which modern physicists are beginning to understand. And this book is going to come out in the next few months. Strongly recommend it. Thanks. Professor Dawkins, uh, do you think our species has evolved to the point where we can now change natural selection for other species and for our own species? <laughs> Uh, for example, postponing natural death processes beyond reproductive life and genetic engineering for other species and genetic counseling. And is that good for our species in the long run? Or is it possible that at some point we'll cease to evolve because we'll be in control of it? Well, we, we already, of course, control selection by introducing artificial selection uh, in agriculture, etc., and also uh, genetic engineering. So that's controlling both the, the selection part of the Darwinian equation and the mutation part of the Darwinian equation. The, you put a slightly different slant on it by talking about, as it were, the release uh, of, um, of humanity, perhaps, especially from the forces of natural selection, which is undoubtedly happening in a sense. Um, thinking more futuristically, one could imagine a sort of science fiction scenario in the future where people plan for future evolution and that could be, you could regard that as a form of eugenics, you could regard it as, as um, ultra-futuristic genetic uh, 
engineering, I think it's going to be feasible. Uh, you ask whether it's a good thing. Um, very difficult to, I mean, it, it has potential to be a terrible thing, uh, but possibly potential to be a good thing as well. And uh, like any very powerful technology, it depends on who gets their clutches on it, which I suppose is ultimately going to be a political decision. And some might take the view that um, they don't trust um, our capacity to control uh, advanced technology enough to, to want the advanced technology to come into being. Um, on the other hand, that might be uh, uh, whatever the expression is, pissing in the wind. <laughs> uh, um, I was having, wondering about something which you alluded to a bit at the beginning of the interview, which was um, the general problem of abiogenesis, how you get from non-living chemical sub chemical soup to a environment in which there are replicators, whether you want to call them living or not, isn't important. Um, is there a good popular treatment on that uh, presently available or available in the near future that you would recommend for somebody interested in specifically that question? Well, um, I, I talked about uh, the Cairn Smith idea, which is now not very fashionable, and the RNA world idea, which is fashionable. Um, I'm not sure, is there, Christian, do you know of a, a single book which would, you'd recommend um, on the RNA world? There's a few, but I, I'm not sure offhand the no. exact titles. We can put them on the web page for the Facebook yeah. the event. Would that be a good thing? It's, it's a very flourishing field in which lots of different people are taking part. And um, so... Um, so it might be a little bit like asking what would be a good book on biology in 1860 to ask <laughs> what would be a well, good book on abiogenesis today. Well, um, I think in 1860 there wouldn't be much doubt which book you'd recommend. Um, <laughs> uh, well, fair enough. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, it's probably just my ignorance that, that I can't give you a, an actual name and an, and an author, but as Christian says, we can put something on the website. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi. Do you think uh, sufficiently advanced alien life would have similar problems as we do with religion, assuming, of course, you are intelligent? <laughs> and then I have one more. Um, we know you like programming, computer programming. My friend wants to know if you have a favorite programming language. <laughs> well, I'm a bit out of date on programming. I, I, I mean, I've done a fair bit of programming in various machine codes, but they're all obsolete now. Uh, and um, I did a, a lot of programming in, in Pascal. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm quite surprised. I, th I, th I thought that was... Um, <laughs> So, but, but no, I'm, I'm hopelessly out, out of date. Um, as for um, uh, exo-religion, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose in a way that becomes another aspect of what I was talking about earlier when I said how much of what we know about life on this planet uh, had to be true and how much just happens to be true. They, in a way, you're asking that very question with respect to religion. Um, and uh, I, I certainly don't think it has to be true. It's, I mean, it's not like replicators, which had to be there. Um, it could be one of those things which is fairly likely to emerge given the uh, shortcomings of uh, nervous systems. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, sir. Um, I just want to say first that you've always been a huge inspiration to me, and I've learned a lot about you on YouTube. And uh, I'd like to ask two questions. First, uh, which, what is your favorite color? And uh, secondly, uh, being an evolutionary biologist, I want to know what you felt about the link between evolutionary biology and, and your different viewpoints or uh, thoughts on the um, presence of homosexuality, not just in humans, but also in many species that exist in this world. Favorite color? I hate that sort of question. Um, <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say white, because it contains all the colors. <laughs> Um, uh, homosexuality, um, it's, it's an obvious conundrum for evolution uh, because on the face of it, it doesn't do much for the survival of 
genes promoting it. It only becomes a problem, of course, if there are genes promoting it. And the best evidence for that comes from twin studies, uh, where, as you know, if you take identical twins and compare them with non-identical twins, then, um, and especially if you can find non, if you can find examples of twins which are reared apart and compare them with twins reared together, if you can get all four boxes um, in your table, uh, and if you can find characteristics which are much more similar between identical twins than between fraternal twins, regardless of upbringing, then that pretty much shows you've got a genetic contribution to the variants. And there is evidence from twin studies that homosexuality has a strong genetic component. So that means we do have a problem because the frequency of, of homosexuality is, is, is high enough um, that it looks as though it, it oughtn't to just be there by kind of random drift. Um, so it might look as though we need a Darwinian theory to explain it. Um, various ones have been suggested. There's the, uh, the worker bee theory um, that um, animals that are, um, that are it, you, you, uncles looking after their nephews and nieces, and, and so not reproducing themselves, but, but preserving their, their genes, in this case, genes for homosexuality um, via uh, uh, collateral kin. Um, then there's the sneaky male uh, hypothesis um, that so-called homosexuals may actually be bisexual, and um, it may, one could imagine a scenario in which, in a primitive, uh, um, I mean, a non, I mean, a, maybe an ancestral human society, um, uh, dominant males went off hunting, leaving the females behind in the care of trusted males who were trusted not to mate with them. And being homosexual, especially ostentatiously homosexual, might be a pretty good badge that you're trustworthy uh, with a woman. Um, but it might not be entirely reliable. <laughs> um, I, I actually favor a, a slightly more subtle theory, um, which is that when one talks about a gene for anything, a gene for X, whatever X is, you have to remember that there's not a kind of one-to-one um, -one inevitable link between the gene and the phenotype. Um, and a gene for X in one environmental condition may be a gene for Y in another environmental condition. And so um, what we detect with twin studies in modern societies as homosexual behavior might have been the very same gene might have been detectable as something quite different in a different environment. I mean, a, a fanciful example might be, suppose that the difference comes from whether you're breastfed as a baby or bottle fed as a baby. This is purely out of my head. I mean, there's no evidence for this at all. But suppose that a particular gene tends to make you homosexual if you're bottle fed, but not if you're breastfed. Then in days before bottles were invented, it would not have been a gene for homosexuality at all. It could have been a gene for something completely different. And so we could be just asking the wrong question when we ask what is the survival value of, of homosexuality. Thank you, sir. Keep on trucking. <laughs> uh, first of all, on behalf of the internet, so I would like to thank you for inventing the meme. <laughs> and secondly, I was, I was wondering, um, when it comes to interesting behavior, what would, I guess, your favorite interesting animal behavior be that you've been able to sort of describe in evolutionary terms besides the uh, naked mole rat? Um, <laughs> favorite animal behavior for, for, for what, was that? Just the... in general, what you found the most interesting in, in animal behavior is kind of something um, unique that's really intrigued you. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> well, um, okay. Um, yeah, there's a there's a caterpillar. You want me just you, you want me to tell a story? Is that is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, a caterpillar which pupates inside a wrapped up leaf, and the way it achieves it is that it 
goes to the, to the stalk of the leaf and bites it halfway across so that the leaf is still hanging from its, the, the, the other half of its stalk, but is cut off from its supply of water from the, from the vessels in the, in the stalk. And so the leaf c curls up and, and wraps itself around the caterpillar. Well, that's pretty nice. <laughs> but there's more, the story goes on. Um, there is a risk to the caterpillar in doing that because if it was the only wrapped up leaf among a, another lot of perfectly good leaves hanging from the same tree, it would be a sitting target for predators. So what it does is it goes round and bites through the stalk of a whole lot of leaves <laughs> and then finally coils itself up in one of them. I think that's a pretty good story. Thank you very much. <laughs>
ghoulies and ghosties and, and, um, and devils and all sorts of things like that. Um, I, I suspect that, that it's actually more distantly removed from Adaptive Valley than, than that, and I suspect that it's rather more that um, superstition is, is an emergent property which probably doesn't have very much of any, very, very much value at, at all. But if, if I'm forced to try to think of an adaptive value, I might think along those sorts of lines. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Dawkins. Um, uh, I think it's a grand occasion to have you here at Maryland University with us tonight. So I want to proceed to my question. Um, a while back, I stumbled across the work of a gentleman named Terence McKenna. I don't know if uh, you're familiar with him. Uh, he was a strong, he was actually more known for his uh, um, promoting uh, psychedelic drug use or uh, I guess uh, recreational in that sense, uh, drug use. So, um, but he, he made an interesting, and this is what stood out to me, he made an interesting point on evolution by mentioning uh, the role that dieting played in, 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 in how we evolved. And specifically what, what, the role that what played? Diet, diets, diet, the, the yes, diet. Okay, yeah. and uh, he, he also, uh, he was known for saying that the, for the, for the, it's on Wikipedia, the stone ape, stoned ape theory, which was basically that our uh, level of consciousness came from uh, psychedelic material within like the dung of other animals, or I guess when we came from, came down from trees as a species, uh, we started indulging in their diet, the diet consisting of feces and so forth. And so I just want to get your opinion on that. How, to what extent do you agree or what, disagree? What was the name again? The st he, he, he promoted the stoned ape theory. No, what, what was his name? Terence McKenna? Yes. I, I, I know nothing about him, um, and I know nothing about his theory. I'm interested that you should tell us about it. Thank you. But I've got no knowledge of it. So, thank Indeed. you. Thank you anyway. I think we have uh, time just for one more question okay. before we go to the book signing. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Doctors. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is on uh, moral uh, evolution, if you will. Uh, we can look back and see how we've evolved uh, morally. Um, you know, you mentioned slavery earlier. Um, women have uh, gotten their, a, lot of, a lot of rights, and uh, gays are now fighting for their rights. And so much changing in our world today, you know, everything from the Middle East to people fighting for their rights here in this country. I was wondering how, if you have any thoughts on uh, more evolution and where we're headed, and if we'll ever achieve... Uh, maybe a, 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 a standard of morality, something like a state of being, like something like a, a Nietzsche's Superman or, or something like that. If we'll ever achieve something like that, and, and if so, uh, is there anything that can be done to accelerate that process? Well, I don't think, I wouldn't know about a, about a, a Superman, but um, I, it, it does appear that the, the shifting moral zeitgeist does move in a pretty consistent direction. And so we could perhaps extrapolate uh, the direction that it's, that it's going in. Um, and I, I don't know whether it would ever reach, a, reach, reach an end, but um, uh, I mean, if, 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 you, if you ask me to say, well, what, what might be the next big step? I would think that it might be a generalization uh, of the idea of opposition to racism, to opposition to speciesism, uh, because after all, um, uh, 200 years ago, everybody was, was racist, um, right. and, and now it's not respectable to be, to be racist. Um, and now it's perfectly respectable to be speciesist. And it's, it, m some people, some moral philosophers are arguing that that will be the next, the next step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.